Um, so I'll start by welcoming you all. Hello, and welcome to Sage Live, April 2023. Uh, before we start, I want to briefly explain what the Sage journey is all about and how Sage Live, what you're joining today, fits into that journey. So Sage Journey is a program whose mission is to inspire and encourage students to explore STEM careers for their future. We do this by offering free summer camps. We have also paid internships, professional growth sessions, and many different opportunities to connect with professionals who care about you and your future. So Sage Live is part of that Sage Journey. And this, as you see, is an online gathering of students who either have attended a camp in the past or who have applied to attend a summer camp uh, in this summer and are curious about the next steps in the Sage Journey. It's also a time to reconnect with Sage volunteers that you may have met if you already participated in a camp. So this is held monthly via Zoom uh, between the months of September and May. And the topics we cover are relevant to your journey. So whether that's career related, such as a workshop called Designing Your Life, or another one that's about resumes, or how to prepare for an interview. Uh, or we also have a new and exciting topics such as quantum computing and artificial intelligence and machine learning that you'll hear about today. And today's speaker is a guest from Fermilab, where I'm, I'm also a scientist, and she's going to share a bit, a little bit about her career path and her current research at the lab. So feel free to join the conversation either by asking questions in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask your question there. So let me present our first speaker that we're very excited to have. Uh, her name is Dr. Alexandra Ciprianovich. She's a Wilson Fellow Associate Scientist in the Data Science Simulation and Learning Division at Fermilab. She's also leading the Cosmic AI Group. So prior to this position, she was an assistant research professor at the University of Belgrade in Serbia and at the Math Mathematical Institute uh, in the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts. She's interested in cosmology and the formation and evolution of structures in the universe, really cool stuff from galaxies and galaxy clusters up to large scale structures. And her work focuses on advancing and building trustworthy and robust artificial intelligence algorithms that will allow us to fully utilize all available data in the era of large astronomical surveys. So thank you so much, Alex, for being here today. Uh, and we'd love to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the lovely intro. Uh, let me share my screen first. Let's see. Do this. And let me also pull up the chat. So yes, I will look at the chat. <laughs> um, and everybody else will also monitor it. So please feel free to ask questions. Uh, comments, everything is welcome. I, I appreciate all of the discussion and everything, um, all of the interaction. So, okay, <laughs> let me start. Um, so, yeah, um, as you heard, I'm going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and in general uh, about my um, career and how come I'm working um, at the intersection of artificial intelligence and and astrophysics um so yeah i i plan to first tell you a little bit about my journey to formula basically um and and to kind of give you a perspective of um how i ended up being a scientist basically um so as jen mentioned i am from serbia that is um a small country in in Europe. You can see it here on the map. Um, it is, you know, in between some of the like more famous um, countries like Italy um, and Germany and Greece, of course, where we really love to go uh, for our summer vacations. So um, I decided that I really wanted to study uh, astrophysics. I was initially in between paleontology because I love dinosaurs <laughs> and I still do and studying space or 
studying astrophysics. So I ended up deciding um, uh, to study astrophysics mainly because um, I was actually shocked that I can study that in Serbia. I didn't really know that this is, was an option. Um, but when I learned that we actually have a very long history of astronomy and astrophysics uh, in, in, um, at my university, I decided that this is definitely the route that I want to take. So um, I uh, did all of my studies in astro, so both the undergraduate studies. So we in Serbia, even at the undergraduate level, you decide what you want to study. So I had an undergraduate degree in astrophysics, and then I also did a master's studies in astrophysics and my PhD also in astrophysics. And I all did all of that at uh, the University of, Math um, of Belgrade. We have that as a part of faculty of mathematics. And, and then inside of the mathematical uh, faculty, we have astronomy. So this is actually this building here on the left. <laughs> and uh, I really wanted to show you the picture of me uh, and my uh, thesis advisor. So she's here on the bottom left. Uh, her name is Tiana Prodanovic. Um, because she actually did her uh, PhD studies in Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then after that, she came back to Serbia and she was studying really cool stuff. Um, so I ended up um, really wanting to work with her. So that's how I kind of decided um, on my topic for my PhD thesis and everything. And the, the, the other girl in the picture is Jovana. She is also a PhD student um, and a really good friend of mine. <laughs> so... Yeah, after that, I also ended up working at my university for a while and also at uh, this other building, which is literally across the street, which is the Mathematical Institute. Um, another thing about me is that while I was studying my, like throughout my PhD and a little bit after that and before that, I also uh, did um, studied dancing and I did all of the Latin and ballroom dances. And after that, I did uh, contemporary ballet, modern ballet, and I actually was a teacher for this. And kind of in the in the morning and throughout the day, I was a scientist. And after that, I was an artist. So I was like uh, teaching um, other students uh, about all of the all of these dances that I mentioned. I really loved it. And it was also helpful because I could have this extra job that uh, paid off some of the um, uh, faculty stuff and, and studies. So yeah, since I was in Serbia, this is a very small community. <laughs> and this, all of these people that you see here in the picture, that's the whole department. Um, these are really, really amazing people. It's a very small and tight community. Um, but, you know, we know each other very well, we collaborate well. And so it was really cool, happy times for me being there and working at the department. And <laughs> it's even funny that like in this picture here, I have a, a t-shirt that says Chicago on it, not knowing that I will actually end up being here in the end. Um, but um, astronomy is actually really cool as a, um, a science, uh, not only because you study space, but also because you get to travel a lot around the world for conferences and for uh, observing with different telescopes. So it really gives you an opportunity to visit some very remote places um, and see some really cool things because like all of the big telescopes are usually very remote um, in places where you otherwise would not go at all, like in deserts or very high mountains and so on. So I ended up traveling, um, quite a lot for work. I even learned how to ski and my boss taught me how to ski. So, and which I really love today. So I'm actually, um, I don't know, I'm happy that um, that ended up being a product of studying astrophysics also. Um, so what did I study? <laughs> Basically, while I was in Serbia and for all of my, like throughout my PhD, I was studying um, the highest uh, energy particles in the universe. We call them cosmic rays. Um, these particles are accelerated in space through very different processes like uh, explosions of stars, so death of stars, for example, can accelerate particles, but also um, uh, very large shock waves that uh, are created when structures are formed. So here you see 
a uh, simulation of, of gravity pulling gas together and forming galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Um, and this is how our universe evolves. But one of the byproducts of this process is acceleration of particles. So this is what I was studying. And it's um, actually, there is a quote um, that I've heard many years ago uh, that says that the space is poor man accelerator. So I was studying literally uh, particles that are much higher energy than anything that we can produce here on Earth. Um, for example, in, in accelerators um, that uh, you know are located at Fermilab and then in Europe and CERN, um, these are very high energies that we can produce, but the space is still more, more powerful. And so I was studying um, different products of interactions of these particles with their surroundings. So the cosmic rays can produce uh, very high energy photons called gamma rays, and we can observe them with telescopes. Uh, they can also produce very interesting, very um, non-interacting particles called neutrinos that we can, for example, detect with these observatories. One of them is Ice Cube that's on the South Pole in ice, very deep in ice. Um, so by studying all of these different products, uh, we can learn about uh, the cosmic rays themselves. Alex, we have a question from Ishani in the chat. I How see. fast are the particles accelerated and are they faster than light? Um, that's a great question. Um, so they can travel really, really fast, almost the speed of light, some of them, but they can never reach the speed. And this, the only reason for that is that they are more massive. They have some mass. And hence, because they have a mass, it's, it's not possible to accelerate them to exactly the speed of light, which is the fastest possible speed. Um, but they can be almost there. So they're extremely fast. And um, they can travel from different galaxies from very, very far away. Um, and throughout this very distant journey, they can interact with the gas, with the dust in space. And this interaction basically uh, can produce all of these interesting things that I've talked about. And this is actually how we learn about them. Um, usually you will not get um, exact cosmic ray um, uh, that you can detect, but you would overall detect all its like byproducts. Uh, but yeah, this is a great question, yes. And they are really, really fast. <laughs> and for example, here on the right, you can see something called uh, a bubble chamber uh, where we can actually see all kinds of interesting particles going through air. And you can see one of these at Fermilab. So I encourage you to visit because um, we have one, a small one, um, that where you, uh, you can exactly see what you see here in this image. Okay, let's move on, yes. So, uh, oh, I see another question. What are particles uh, cosmic rays composed of? Um, is it photons and neutrinos? So cosmic rays can be more or less whatever you want. So these are the particles uh, that exist in space that end up being in some kind of violent event. Um, so there are often um, protons or other um, heavier nuclei, but you can also accelerate much heavier nuclei, like nuclei of a carbon atom or uh, anything else, even iron atoms. Um, you can also have very energetic electrons and other particles. So basically, more or less anything <laughs> that uh, exists can be um, accelerated or uh, will end up being uh, a product of the initial interactions of these uh, energetic particles with the surroundings. Yeah. OK, cool. So. This is the this whole topic, all everything that I've so far talked about is related to my PhD and my time in Serbia, basically. Um, but at some point, after a couple of years of working in science and being at the university, I um, started hearing more and more about artificial intelligence, about machine learning, and I got really intrigued. I was really interested in learning more, and I was interested in applying this to my own research. But this was still 
fairly new um, at the time, and I didn't have anybody else in Serbia, whether that is at my university or at our astronomical observatory that we have. I didn't have anybody else doing anything with uh, machine learning for astro. Um, so I kind of had to look elsewhere for uh, people to learn from, for collaborators. And I also decided that I wanted to uh, apply for postdocs and, and change uh, basically the place where I work so that I can learn more about this. Um, so I started applying for postdocs uh, in, in the US. Um, and I tried it for two years, um, but I, I did end up having a couple of interviews, uh, but I didn't really get any jobs because it was very hard um, for me to kind of uh, um, apply completely like kind of outside of my small Serbian bubble um, because Serbia doesn't really have that much uh in money for science and hence we we it's very hard for us to collaborate uh with different countries and us is very far away so like traveling back and forth to us isn't really a realistic option for us so people here didn't really know me um and of course there are many people applying from all, all over the world to postdocs here so it's really it wasn't easy for me to kind of um go through all of that um but i was really determined that to learn about ml so this didn't stop me i decided that fine i will not do this postdoc <laughs> i will at least start to collaborate with people and i will just sit at, uh, at in my office in serbia and just collaborate online like that so um i ended up uh working with uh dr brian nord you can see him here he's um um also um an ai plus astrophysics uh person a scientist here at fermilab um and um i also started uh, joined deep skies lab uh which i uh really recommend everybody to join you can also as undergrads and as high school students if you're interested in learning about ml and astrophysics this is really such a great supportive community that helped me tremendously and that i'm still a very big part of um i kind of manage all of my projects can do this um, um group of people still so i encourage you to look at this website also if you're interested in these topics you might find really interesting things there um, so yeah, I kind of joined that. I started working with Brian and, uh, well, basically learned ML on my own and, and collaborating with him. So, so Parnika has a question. When is it too late to start getting into AI? It's never too late. So you see, like, even for me, um, I had, so I finished all of my studies and I worked for a few years as a scientist and then decided to learn something new. Um, so it's definitely never too late. And especially for AI, I think, so first of all, all of you, if you go into STEM uh, in, in your at university, you will probably have uh, some kind of AI course that you will learn. For example, when I was studying, uh, there was no AI course or anything like that, even remotely similar to AI, because it wasn't, um, as popular or or well developed at that time, but on top of that, you have all kinds of um, online courses and amazing tutorials that, to learn from, and that is kind of where I started from. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, internet is your friend. Definitely, there are so many books and great material that people are already like working on and and developing for for all of us to learn. I see another question. Was it difficult to get into AI and ML by yourself without any help? Um, honestly, not really, but that's because I had amazing support from the people that I started collaborating with. So from uh, Brian and from Deep Skies and all of the people over there, uh, there is, it's just a very big community from like high schoolers to like, full-on scientists who've been in this work for decades. And everybody is at kind of different stages of learning and everybody wants to help each other out. So I was, I think, really lucky. Um, so it wasn't that hard. It was also a lot of fun. 
and it, I, it was also useful for me that I actually had a real project. It wasn't like a side thing that I was doing. I really like dedicated my time and my work for that. And it, you know, it, it wasn't that hard in the end. Okay, so let me kind of, the next step <laughs> continue. So the next step was um, after working with, uh, with Brian and with Fermilla kind of online only, um, at some point I was able to visit Fermilab as a visiting scientist and that was unfortunately right before COVID. Um, so I ended up spending a month of like being at Fermilab in like normal conditions and then everything kind of shut down and I, I was still there but I couldn't go to the lab and couldn't like meet new people. Um, so it was kind of weird, uh, but also I was still grateful that I had this at least one month of experiencing fully what Fermilab really is. Um, and so I kind of stayed around um, in, in virtual version of it. Uh, and while COVID was happening, I applied for a postdoc position at Fermilab and I got it. So I stayed. And um, after that postdoc position, I also applied for uh, to be like a Wilson Fellow Associate Scientist and I got that. So that's how kind of how I stayed. I came in for a month, but stayed for years. And I'm very happy uh, that this is kind of how it played out. So yeah, so now I want to kind of talk a little bit about what I do now. So this is my journey to Fermilab, but what do I do now? So obviously, as the title suggests, I do artificial intelligence and machine learning. I started learning this six or seven years ago, I think. Um, so let's say that seven years ago, I knew very little about machine learning because my all of my research was more theoretical astrophysics. So it was kind of different than what I'm doing now. Okay. So before going into what I do and showing you just a couple of like fun, quick examples of the projects that I was involved in, um, I want to first talk about uh, why artificial intelligence is so like big in science and in astrophysics today. So if we look through the history of astronomy and astrophysics research, um, we initially learned about the universe by building simple or small telescopes. And this is an actual small telescope that we have in Serbia uh, at our observatory. We don't really use it anymore because it's basically now in the city center almost. So it's not dark enough to observe anything with it. So after doing this, we built uh, telescopes that we can send in orbit like Hubble. And then that allowed us to see a lot fainter objects and have a lot better resolution of our pictures. Um, so it helped us uh, see a much bigger um, universe much farther away. Uh, we also realized that if we make arrays of telescopes like these here, radio telescopes, for example, you can basically mimic like um, the effects of having one absurdly huge telescope, but at a fraction of a cost. So building a bunch of small ones and then together their power is much, much larger. And because of all of these things, today we have uh, sky surveys. So observations of the entire sky, everything that you can see in all directions in many different wavelengths. So here you have a couple of examples, um, one uh, being in radio, one in gamma rays, one in x-rays. So basically these are all uh, just photons of, of different energy and different wavelength. And they give you a different puzzle piece explaining different physical processes in the universe. And you need all of these to kind of understand how everything works. But on the other hand, we also have to think about computing. So when we built first computers in the 60s, um, these computers were by today's standards, absurdly big and heavy and huge. So you would have uh, one super expensive computer that filled entire room and everybody, for example, at that 
uh, institution, for example, a university would use this one computer. And the power of this whole computer was much smaller than, for example, what your uh, telephones and, and mobile phones can do today. But this quickly evolved and even like in next 20 years, we were able to reduce the size to much smaller and then every individual could buy its own PC and have a computer at home. Um, and then again, a couple of decades later, uh, we have all of the all of us having a couple of our own like personal computers, maybe that's a smaller laptop, we have a computer in our phones and tablets and so on. But today we actually are even beyond that. So today, everybody has, of course, a plethora of personal computers in cars, phones, washing machines even. But you can also, for free or by paying for this service, use much more powerful computers that are owned by universities in big companies like Google and so on. So basically, you have more or less an uh, infinite amount of computing resources. And so because of these two drivers, big data sets like sky surveys and billions and billions of astrophysical objects that we have observed, and enough computing power, we are talking about AI basically today. So in general, astrophysics and cosmology, it's all about understanding the universe. So um, first of all, understanding the question, are we alone? So studying exoplanets and, and other worlds and search for life, or how did we even get here? So understanding how stars form and evolve, um, how galaxies form and evolve and interact and so on. And how does our universe even work? So maybe understanding the extreme parts of it, things like dark matter, uh, that uh, we're trying to understand what it is, but we kind of see its effects um, or dark energy that um, drives the expansion of the universe. What is it? Why is it expanding the universe? What is going on? And so today we are doing all of these studies by using experiments like those that we have at Fermilab and at Slack and other labs, of course, and telescopes and astronomical surveys that I've already shown. We have uh, simulations of individual astrophysical objects or whole universes that we can simulate. And because these both of these types of data sets are really, really big, we luckily also have artificial intelligence today to kind of bridge all of these data sets and allow us to learn from very complex information. So before going any further, I do want to spend a minute uh, talking about these three terms because you will hear them a lot from me and from anybody else talking about AI. So those three terms are artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. They're kind of similar, but not really the same. So the, the, the biggest term here is artificial intelligence, and it includes any kind of program that uh, we can write that can mimic intelligent humor behavior. So based on some inputs, do this. But you can hard code it and explicitly say to machine what to do in which circumstance. Then subset of that would be machine learning, um, which these are uh, programs that allow a machine to learn and improve from experience by giving it a set of data that it can learn from. Um, and finally, a subset of that would be deep learning, which is kind of similar, like machine learning, but it also uses more complicated um, programs um, called neural networks uh, and algorithms. And these neural networks are still there to help the algorithm to, to learn from experience and from examples um, and, and gain experience as it sees more data. But the algorithm itself, the neural network, is more complicated. So the history of AI isn't very long. Um, so these two guys here, um, uh, McCulloch and Pete, McCulloch is on the left, and Pete, so in the 40s, they, uh, they were the first two people who uh, talked about and invented artificial neurons. So the guy on the left, McCulloch, was uh, a neurologist, and Pete 
uh, was more uh, into math. Um, and they realized that, um, you see, that a neuron, so one cell in our brain, is quite simple. It can be described with um, these dendrites on the left that gather electrical pulses and information, process it somewhere uh, here in this soma part, and via axion forward it to the next neuron, which connects uh, via these synapses here. So on its own, it is very simple, but combine billions and million, millions and billions of these cells, you can do very complicated tasks. So individual neuron can be easily described in a mathematical terms. So you have some numbers X from one to N that are inputs. They're processed here, which I guess would be the sum apart and forwarded this result Y to you forwarded to the next one. So AI as a field was established in 56. And uh, the actual first very interesting uh, kind of algorithm was Fukushima's neocognitron that learned to understand shapes basically by dividing a complicated shapes into smaller, simpler pieces and combining the simple information into more and more complicated shapes until you figure out the whole um, shape. And this is basically kind of a premise of how uh, neural nets today work with images. And in 88, uh, Jan LeCun actually made uh, a neural network that uh, was called convolutional neural network that uh, was able to process digits in US checks. So understand the head written digits uh, and automatically scan your check, know which account it, the money should go to. And automatically you can do this much faster and put uh, move the money around. So in even today, these uh, algorithms are still used. But you couldn't really do much more than that, much complicated things until uh, 2012, when everything kind of escalated. And it was all thanks to Alex Krzyzewski. You can see him here. And at that time, he was a PhD student. So <laughs> a lot of cool things happened because students did amazing things. So what he learned uh, at that, he was learning at that time how to program on graphical cards. So things in your computers that we use for gaming. Um, these are much faster uh, than uh, regular CPUs. And he was learning how to program things basically that, for example, you can use for gaming. And he realized that if he, if he were to rewrite the code that Yad Lakun did, such that it can run on a GPU, he could do things much faster and because of that, do more complicated things. And he did that and entered this ImageNet competition, which was a yearly competition where people were coding different types of programs with the aim of classifying images. So you have hundreds of classes of dogs, cats, boats, and cars, and you want to write the algorithm that is the most accurate in classifying these classes. And he won with his neural network and the margin was huge compared to everything else. So people got really excited. And out of, out of this one thing, all of the things that happened later uh, really like escalated quickly and we got machine learning and deep learning for all sorts of things. So in astronomy, Machine learning is really useful because it can handle huge data sets, which we always had. So it can accelerate research. You can create models based on all of the data that you have. Um, and so you don't have to approximate things anymore. So if we were to write an equation and study space with an equation, we would probably have to approximate a galaxy with a sphere or a disk. And obviously galaxies are not spheres and disks. So finally, we don't have to do this approximation anymore. Um, so AI helps us with all kinds of unexpected discoveries and with simplifying very complex problems and complex data sets and just looking at the most important parts of the data. So um, a neuron that I already kind of mentioned uh, when I was showing you the history of AI um, 
is again as i said very simple thing you have uh we can also call it a per perceptron so you can kind of both of these two things here um, very often so again you have some inputs um they're multiplied by some parameters that the neural network actually learns throughout uh its training these weights w and you sum them up in this um central soma part that mimics the actual neural uh, cell in the brain and you uh, output this value and forward it to the next one and basically by combining many neurons you can get different types of architectures so this is a very simple one you have some inputs x you have one round of, like one row of um, neurons this n one two and three and their outputs are forwarded to the output layer and you get some answer here some number for example this is called a multi-layer perceptron but obviously you can envision a much complicated much more complicated system which is called a deep neural network where you have many of these hidden layers with many neurons and of course the outputs can also be um, more complicated and so in astronomy we very often work with images and so I wanted to show you three different types of tasks that we can do with images um, uh, using machine learning so one is classification so for example recognizing that this image contains a dog so a class dog um, you can do detection so you can say okay in this image I have two dogs and one dog is in this box and the other dog is in this other box so kind of finding where these objects are but you can do the final like most complicated task which is segmentation so it's basically finding exact pixels that belong to a dog. So it's kind of like classifying each pixel of the image. So you know that this pixel belongs to a dog, but this one is of a stick and this one is background. So we use all of these different things in astronomy too. Um, so let me quickly show you how a neural network that works with images looks like. So you have three parts you have images that go into your neural network so examples um many dog images with labels dog and many cat images with cat labels right or in our case many galaxy images star images or whatever else we want to study then you have your neural network and then it outputs a class so once you show it enough examples just like to a baby if you show it enough examples of galaxies or dogs it will know how they look like and then it will be able to classify a new image of a dog or a galaxy so it is done by having a galaxy and having many filters that scan this image and give you some information whether maybe um where you can find interesting uh very bright points or horizontal lines and vertical lines and so on and then you com combine these simple information the simple information into more and more complicated as you go deeper into the network at some point this information is squished together into just this one layer that has a couple of numbers or thousand numbers but it's still just individual 1d layer and then those are the inputs of something that looks more like those uh neural networks that I showed you before where each neuron is connected to all of the other neurons these neurons then learn to classify images and I see an, a question I will uh, answer it in just a second um so once you learn to do all of this the network outputs classes and how probable they are so if I'm my task is to classify star galaxy and nebula hopefully if the network sees enough images and enough examples it will for this particular image give the largest number for a galaxy class and hence the classification will be correct okay so question is are there any libraries you use for classification so yes, uh, we all use Python as our coding language, 
And in Python, you have many libraries that already exist that can help you create a neural network and train it. And there are many like big packages that you can use things. If you've heard of TensorFlow or PyTorch or Keras, all these libraries basically have everything that you need to build a neural network. Okay. Uh, question. Do you think you'll study AI in astrophysics for the rest of your career, or will you continue trying new things? <laughs> oh, okay. So I don't know. Um, we'll see. Um, I really, for, for now, I know that I really am interested in science, in physics in general, um, whether that is um, high energy uh, particle physics or astrophysics or something else. And I really like AI. So I feel like I will continue to use these tools um, throughout my career, but whether I will slightly diverge to something uh, else, we'll see. Um, usually people like to change things up to like keep it uh, interesting, but you know, you never know. Will AI be used to study dark matter, dark energy? AI is already being used to study dark matter and dark energy. Um, we are studying dark matter and dark energy from observations, from data. And uh, basically, as I said before, because the data is so vast, uh, trying to understanding is, <laughs> understand it is very hard. So AI is already helping us study both of these things. Um, next question, <laughs> how much data do you usually need to feed the AI, like images, for it to get pretty accurate? Uh, in identifying stars, galaxies, et cetera. So that is, uh, you need a lot. Um, so if you're starting to learn from scratch, so your neural network knows absolutely nothing, <laughs> then you probably need at least a few thousand in each of the classes. Um, but you can also start from networks that already know how to classify some other thing, maybe dogs and cats or different astrophysical objects. So these in, uh, programs already learned how to identify some shapes, even though those shapes are not the ones that you care about. In that case, you can take the train network and have a lower amount of data, so not thousands, maybe hundreds, and then retrain it to modify it to do what you want it to do. In that case, you can like pull off training with a fewer number of images. Okay, I will answer this question that I see now and then move on, but yeah, and then we can answer more questions later. So does the feature map require a lot of storage? I know in general AI requires a good amount of powerful storage, but I was wondering if this can be done more efficiently. Um, so yes, and not always. So um, depends on, of course, how big the images are. If your data set is really big and images are really big, then of course, yes, you will need a lot of memory to, to load all of this data and to train with it. Um, it also depends on how complicated the problem is, how big and complicated your network is. Um, but in, you don't always need a very complicated network. So um, yeah, depending on how problematic the, the, uh, the data set is, um, it might be very big, but not always. Okay. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> um, this is basically, I just wanted to show you how it looks when you scan your image with a filter. So it's basically just matrix multiplication and maybe even better, I can show you here. So here we're scanning an image with filters. It's just, yeah, it's not an astro image, but it can show you kind of how by scanning with different filters, you end up ex um, extracting different type of feature maps and different type of information. And this is basically how an, a neural network would see, uh, for example, numbers. So you scan your image as you go deeper into the network, the dimensions of, of uh, all of these uh, layers reduces. So it looks less um, reasonable for us, but it's just a compressed kind of information. And then it the output should be, as I mentioned before, the largest for the Colorect class after the training has been done. But yeah, um, 
the AI, you have a bunch of different architectures, different applications from classifying galaxies um, and dogs or whatever, uh, to dancing robots and, and doing all kinds of very interesting and different types of problems. Okay, so let me go to one more question before showing you what are the typical tasks in astrophysics. So how is artificial intelligence, uh, how are artificial intelligence companies able to reduce this data set to make it engaging, but still accessible uh, easily through multiple types of devices? Um, so yeah, so depending on the task, so some, some tasks are super complicated, like for example, chat GPT uh, that you've we probably heard a lot about in late last month and this month. <laughs> um, so these models are very big, very complicated, and they were training for a very long time with insane amounts of data. So this is not these sort of models are too complicated for us as users to actually train on our own. So this can only be done by huge companies that have very, very big compute power. Um, so in this case, yeah, this is not something that you can do at home. Um, but then uh, for different types of problems, smaller data sets, smaller problems, you can train on your own. But the the other side of that is if an in, in industry, you develop a very complicated model like chat GPT or things on your uh, telephones that can put a funny um, filter or a funny hat on top of your head. So all, all these things are AI. Um, and the good thing about them is that once the training is done, so even if it used gigabytes and terabytes of data, um, once the model is trained, it, you don't need any more data. It works for this particular, specific, uh, particular task. So. If I want to uh, talk to Jeff, chat GPT that is now trained, I can do that. I don't need any more data or anything like that. And because of that, industry now can have all of these different interesting applications and all of you as end users can use it without needing any big compute power uh, because the model is already trained. If I'm hoping I answered your question. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, we don't have that much time left, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, keep the questions coming. I love the interaction. So um, in astrophysics, there are a couple of like main applications of AI, different kind of types of problems. So one of them uh, I already talked about a lot is image and data processing and analysis. Um, we can speed up simulations. So, um, so Astrophysics simulations and physics simulations in general are very complicated, and we need them a lot. But it's you again. You need a lot of computing power and a lot of time uh, to write uh, the code and run it for these simulations. And uh, with AI, we can actually once we train on a simulation that we already have, we can generate more data um, and basically make an emulator that can speed up. Uh, generation of new data uh, without the need uh, of, of actually running this slow um, code. Uh, it is also helpful for scheduling on operations. So in our telescopes and in uh, we have a lot of users that want to observe um, different things with, our, with the telescopes. And even though we have many telescopes, we have even more astronomers. So figuring out how to best optimize who gets the time on a telescope and when so that you maximize your scientific output and you have the least amount of downtime of telescope not running. Um, AI is really good at this also. And, and a lot of people are working on this too. And also even like, like those robots that are dancing, you can also, teach a telescope how to observe efficiently and how to move on its own. And hopefully like in the future, um, we're gonna have a lot more automated uh, observatories. And they're very good at, at finding weird things. So they can be used to, to make alert systems. Um, so for example, 
um, if you teach your model to recognize normal stuff, it can also often alarm you when something is not normal. So more, for example, explosions of stars or supernovae, um, they are very rare. You can see one here. <laughs> they're very, very rare, but they're very valuable because we learn a lot about star evolution, about actually expansion of the universe, about production of heavy elements, all kinds of things. But we really need to catch them on time because this, this super bright um, glow and its uh, slow dimming actually happens in a matter of, of days. So we really want to be able to see it on time and move all of the telescopes to, to observe as much as we can while it still exists. Oh, there are so many questions, I can't see them all. Uh, are there any ML algorithms that require computation power that we do not have yet? Is that when quantum computers are necessary? Um, yes, you are correct. So yeah, we have um, big appetite. So we um, want to build more and more complicated algorithms. Um, and of course, um, even today, sometimes we don't have um, enough compute power um, to do that. Um, quantum computers, once they become mainstream, um, are definitely going to help with that. We already have, um, in some sense, quantum computers, but they're definitely not at the level of actually doing AI on them. Uh, I'm hoping that I will see them being commercially made <laughs> while I'm still doing science so that I can maybe even train AI on them. Uh, but yes, they, they will definitely help once once we develop them enough to so that we can like do things like what we're doing with regular computers now. Okay. Um, so this I really wanted to show you <laughs> is the number of scientific publications, so journal papers and conference papers that scientists are writing in astronomy and astrophysics that have machine learning and AI in them. So you can see that like in beginning of 2000s, you had maybe a couple of hundreds, maybe a thousand papers per year, but the numbers are kind of skyrocketed after that. And there's uh, doesn't seem like the this is this trend is changing, at least for now. So yeah, this is really a very like fruitful combination of, of uh, AI and, and physics. Okay, so one more question before I go to actual examples of, uh, of uh, what I work on because we don't have any more time. Um, so when do you estimate they will be more mainstream? Um, I don't really know. I don't wanna guess this because I'm not in um, quantum computing. Um, we have people at Fermilab who are, who probably would be better um, to answer this question, um, but yeah. I'm, I'm sure that you will get to see that and you will work with them. I'm hoping that I will also. <laughs> um, so, okay, let me show you at least one example of the things that I work on. Um, well, this is a project that I did with um, Alex Derlika Wagner. He is also here at Fermilab and he is also at UChicago. Um, and his PhD student, Dimitrios Tanoglidis, um, we wanted to, uh, learn to, to teach a, a machine learning model to distinguish between very, very, very faint galaxies. We call them low surface brightness galaxies or LSBGs. You have examples here on the left. You see it's like they're almost not visible at all. And other faint, we call them artifacts, which is basically anything else that's faint that gets picked up um, by uh, some automated algorithms. You can see them here on the right. Um, these galaxies, even though they don't look very nice, <laughs> they are crucial for understanding the evolution uh, of matter in the universe and studying how uh, dark matter affects also uh, formation of galaxies. They're actually the most numerous galaxies that exist. But before, because they are um, very faint, they're actually fainter than the night sky. <laughs> um, we couldn't really observe them before. So the first good catalog of these LSPGs was done with a dark energy survey, uh, which is a survey that Fermilab uh, has a very big um, 
is very big part of. Um, so interestingly, um, the, when we were trying to make this catalog, there were around 400,000 candidates um, that were extracted from all of the data. But it turns out that only 10% of them were actually real LSBGs. This was done by hand. So like Dimitrios and other students had to look through these images and find real LSBGs on their own. And this was a very tedious, very slow and, and very big task. And with the next generation of telescopes and even like the next year of observations by, by DES, Dark Energy Survey, you'll have even more candidates. So this is not something that we can do by, by eye anymore. It's just not possible. So we want something that's good, but automated. And we were able to do that. We trained the neural network to distinguish between these two categories. Here in, you can see that like these like red parts are where the neural network looks at the most. And you can see that when it comes to galaxies, it looks at galaxies. And when it comes to these weird artifacts, which can be like a portion of a star or something like that, it does also recognize what these are. And it was very efficient. So, I will skip these because we don't have a lot of time because I wanted to actually end with something else that I find is important for me to say at the end. Um, so artificial intelligence has very, very big pros <laughs> and I talked a lot about them, but also very big cons and things that we need to be like cautious about. Um, so, Pros are things that I've mentioned so far. So it's the AI is really good at working with huge data sets. The speed of analysis is uncomparable to like things that the other methods uh, can do. Um, we can avoid all kinds of biases and problems that uh, humans can introduce by doing things by hand. And we can make models that include all of the details and no approximation. So galaxies no longer have to be spheres or disks. But as any model trained on data, the model can only be as good as the data. So if you have a problematic data set that is biased in any way, the model is going to learn that bias. And we have seen that in many science and industry applications. So if you are going to work with AI in the future, you really, I urge you to, to think about this problem. And I want you to very carefully think about your data and does it have any kind of problems? And where is your model going to be used afterwards? Is it going to be used for some other application that was not initially intended? Because if it is, it might not perform very well on this other task. So all of these things that you have to con consider very carefully. And I'm actually going to give you a non-Astro example to, to show you what I mean, because I feel like this is super important. All of you, if you end up going to STEM careers, maybe are going to either build AI or are going to use AI at some point somewhere. And I want you to be able to like understand what is behind the code that you're building or using. So this is uh, a data set called Labeled Faces in the Wild. Um, it was built in 2007 and it was made by scraping online articles and making these cutouts of people's faces. The goal of this data set was to be used as a test for uh, facial recognition software. So building AI that knows how to recognize human faces, that for example, now is used on your phones to be able to track your face and put again, a filter on you. Um, and all of the big companies uh, were competing to make the best possible software. Um, and they kind of succeeded. They were very proud in the results, but there was a problem. So this whole data set was actually, because it was very big and nobody ever checked, <laughs> it was actually made of 77% male faces. And out of those, 83 were white male faces. So an example, which is very extreme, is that President uh, Bush had 530 images, which was kind of expected. It, it was in many news articles. But on the other side, you had uh, dark skinned females uh, that were like half of that number. 
Um, so what ended up happening is that these methods uh, were very precise at classifying uh, light-skinned males. So we had 1.3% uh, uh, um, error rate. But when it came to dark-skinned females, the method had almost 35% error rate, which is just unacceptable completely. Um, and so until people uh, figure this out, these algorithms were already started to be used in many places. And this is absolutely horrible. So whether you're studying galaxies or doing something in industry like this, it's tremendously important for you to be aware of this sort of problem. So I will just end by saying that, yes, in, in astrophysics, you can um, use AI in many, many different types of applications, like analyzing, studying all kinds of astrophysical objects, pre-processing data, speeding up simulation, and helping us with new weird discoveries. Uh, but again, AI as a field is evolving so quickly, much quicker than any other science. So I'm very excited to see what will happen in a year and in five years. I probably can't even imagine what are we going to do with AI in five years. And I also want on the other side to say a few things that are more like personal observations that I feel I want to share with you, which is, um, as you've seen through this whole story, I changed the thing that I uh, worked on and, and kind of my interests throughout my career. And also I've kind of faced some more challenging um, uh, moments of like how to move from a small country somewhere else, how to find opportunities so that I can do what I want. But I feel like from all of this, I learned that really you kind of need to try to pursue your interests and the things that you really care about. And then you can kind of, you will find a way. And more importantly, connections and networking are really important. So I applaud you to that you're here and that you already are taking step, steps to like be wherever you see yourself in a couple of years. Um, and when we, I guess in STEM, it's very nice because scientists are usually really, really nice people. <laughs> like it's really easy to, co to connect with them and ask them questions and reach out. And most of them, even when they're very busy, will reply. Um, so throughout your uh, studies in, in, uh, at the university, reach out to people, meet people, ask them about their experience, or if you wanna learn from them, this will end up helping you throughout this whole journey quite a lot. It has helped me a lot. And I think that it's kind of, I, I want you to understand the importance of networking also for uh, a STEM career. And finally, if you're interested in AI, you're in luck because there is a lot of um, opportunities to learn. And also there will be a lot of opportunities for you to find a job, whether that is in science or in industry. There are so many things. And so, uh, yeah, if this is something that you want to do, go for it. And I'm sure you will do great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really interesting. I think we have some time for questions and there's a couple uh, that were already in the chat, but others, please feel free to add more. Um, let me go back a little bit. Izzy asked, how is dark matter and energy studied with AI? Like what kinds of experiments? Mm -hmm. So um, one most like obvious, well, one example that I already, mentioned is actually, for example, by studying these low surface brightness galaxies. So um, depending on what dark matter is and how much we have it, it will affect how the visible matter evolves, for example. So being able to find low surface brightness galaxies and understanding how many of these galaxies exist, how concentrated they are and how they behave, you can implicitly from that learn how much dark matter might exist or what kind of particle uh, dark matter is. So by studying um, using AI, the things that we do see, we can then infer what dark matter might be. So this is just one example. And there are also, well, there are many other examples where you're studying either dark matter or dark energy, 
by studying things that you do see. Um, and this is usually how we have to study these with or without AI. It's by studying things that we can detect. Um, the next step only in the studies is that with AI, we can better analyze the things that we do see. So in most cases, you would study both dark matter and dark energy this way. Great, thank you. So there's also a question and a related comment. So I'll read both of them to you. The, first, the question was, do you think it will ever be possible to eliminate bias in AI? And the comment was, I think bias is created by humans, so I doubt it could be eliminated in uh, AI. What do you What do you think? Well, I would agree. So, at least, well, depends like what kind of uh, task and and what kind of data set you have. So, if it's related to industry and learning uh, anything related to humans. <laughs> so whether that is le learning from images or learning from text uh, and textual data that, for example, ChatGPT was learning from, of course, it's going to learn all of the problematic things that we have in that data set and all of the things that reflects who we are. Um, our task in this case is to try to step away from all of that and try to think about what are the things that we know exist as a bias, but that we would love to eliminate. That if we ha had the power to become better versions of ourselves, what are the things that we want to, to remove? And then try to change the data that the model trains on such that the model itself does not learn the biases that we know exist. Of course, the problem there is obvious. What about the biases that we do not know exist? And yes, this will always be a problem, but that's why everybody who works in AI should really like try to think very carefully about these things and also always know that there might be hidden problems that we still don't know about and always kind of question themselves. And the same goes for science, absolutely the same. So in science, it's even worse because we're studying things that we don't know. <laughs> so it's very easy to have unknown unknowns. So whether that is new information that we were not even thinking about or problems with the data that uh, we don't know about because we don't understand the nature. <laughs> so we don't know that it exists. And of course, this will uh, be the problem. It was a problem before AI. It is a problem now with AI. Uh, but yeah, it's our job, I guess, as scientists as, and as developers of AI to kind of try to think about this. Mm -hmm. So we have also a question from Minnow, which is, what are some projects in physics that are using AI outside of astrophysics? What are some other data science techniques? Mm -hmm. uh, well, there is quite a lot. I mean, the all of the science, all of science branches are using AI like crazy, uh, from developing new medicine and drugs, or or uh, understanding better understanding in medicine how to like understand the MRIs and other uh, types of, of um, basically uh, observing your own body um, to high energy physics and biology and all sorts of things. So for example, at Fermilab, um, we have all sorts of experiments that are very, very complicated. And hence the data is also very, very complicated. So for example, when you collide particles, you get crazy showers of many different things that uh, is that are produced from these collisions. And it's really, really challenging to try to figure out which um, part of this mess belongs to which particle, basically. So we have groups of people developing AI from all of the experiments that have already happened that we have studied and we know like which particles were created at which time um, to try to learn how to decipher this mess <laughs> that happens every time the particles collide so that uh, you can do this automatically or more accurately and faster the next time you run your collider. Um, and, you know, many different experiments have many different types of, of um, 
different looking data, but in many cases, we, for example, try to automate this process of finding the weird cool thing in the data quickly. Yeah, I can add to that. We definitely also use AI in doing that same sort of thing in studying neutrino interactions. And um, at Fermilab, we have a group working in the accelerator division that's trying to use AI to learn when there are weird situations in the accelerator to be able to identify them earlier so that the accelerator operates more efficiently and smoothly. And we can eliminate some of the, the weird edge case problems that happen um, just among in the operations and, and get get early warning signals so we can tune things in the accelerator and not have that happen. So hopefully that will improve our accelerator operations in the future. We've got a couple more questions also. Uh, so Fiona asks, would it be possible to use AI to train other AI? Good question. This is a great question and yes. And it has already been used and it has been done and is also being developed and being becoming more complicated and complicated. This is often um, used in uh, something that we call reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, so these are algorithms, for example, that uh, learn to play ping pong or any other more complicated game, or even the thing that uh, Jen mentioned where you want to learn how to control an accelerator so that you have all of this plethora of sensors and data and from this you need to learn how to modify um, um, some things in the accelerator such that you get optimal uh, performance every time so these sort of algorithms uh, in some cases can be trained by having actually two neural networks one that is uh, teacher and one that is student and then the, this interaction between two, uh, two neural networks actually um, is helping the student to learn uh, a, a better model in the end. So this is a very like interesting and fun type of uh, problem. Cool. Then we have a question from Quinn, I think, and that is, what do you think about the possibility of AI taking over human jobs? Do you think <laughs> there will ever be a time when AI can surpass human intelligence? Yikes. <laughs> Oh, tough questions. So I feel like, I don't know, these are two, maybe two separate questions. So I don't think that AI will take over human jobs. It's the same to me personally, at least it's the same like um, when we were developing um, factories with machinery for the first time, and then all of a sudden we didn't make all of the things just by hand work um, so manually and then people were scared that now that the machine can make um, a car much faster than I can will I lose a job well yes and no because then this opens up a plethora of new jobs and things evolve so um, yes maybe we're not making cars by hand anymore but there are other things that people are doing and I think in the same way introducing AI more and more into like everyday jobs will just help us evolve um, the way we work. It's not gonna like replace us at all, I think. Um, yeah, and then I guess for the intelligence, I guess it depends how you measure it. I don't think that, so the AI will always have this problem and limit that um, it is just as good as the, the current training so it won't be able, it's not able to like creatively think and, and extrapolate very correctly a lot. So I think that in that case, um, if we think about it that way, I don't think it will ever be smarter than us, but it will definitely be more and more capable and, and um, complicated as the time goes by. Cool. Samya has a question. Is it possible that there can be a master AI which can further make other machine learning models to address specific purposes or tasks in astrophysics? Yeah, why not? I think so. So like if we were to build something that's very universal and then um, train it to learn how to give um, 
tasks to other networks, how to give it the inputs and outputs so that these like sub programs learn smaller problems to solve smaller problems. Um, then yeah, why not? We don't have anything like that yet, but I don't see why we wouldn't be able to make something like that in the future. Very interesting. And then one last question from Maya, which is how do you come up with ideas for projects? Question. <laughs> uh, this is a very cool question. Um, so when you're doing science, you kind of slowly learn to do this by like many different using many different skills. So first you kind of start learning one topic that maybe is your PhD thesis or something like that. Uh, but then as you know more and you see what other people are, are doing and working on, this sparks ideas of how to combine the thing that you know with the thing that you saw other people know. And then ultimately we're all studying the same uh, nature. So it's very, um, I don't know, inspiring to think about how to combine uh, different projects, different uh, knowledge bases together. Um, and I think in that sense, science is a little bit like art. It really, you need to be creative and you need to be able to creatively think um, and, and be able to use your skill sets and the skill sets of people around you so that you can kind of collaboratively uh, get to this next cool thing. I don't know, I find this, this part of, of my work very like fun and inspiring. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, me too. Same. All right. I think we are out of time for questions. So we have a couple of um, stuff, uh, pieces of information we'd like to share with you about next month's Sage Live. And I think Danny will share a screen. Um, Alex, if you can stop yes. sharing. Well. But thank you so much. That was fascinating. I learned a lot and I really enjoyed learning about your journey as well. Thank you. This was a lot of fun for me. <laughs> Great. All right. So thank you all for attending this Sage Live this month. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. We will have a uh, Sage Live next month, but it's going to be a little bit different. We'll have two dates where four of the national labs, two on each day, will talk about different types of accelerators at their national lab. So join us please on May 13th and May 20th. Uh, there will be an invitation email that you should stay tuned for. And then you can also subscribe to our channels uh, so on social media to help us reach out to other students like you. you. Um, so here's the contact information for Sage Journey at the bottom. Feel free to email us and look us up on uh, Instagram and uh, at this at Sage S Camp. And we hope to see you all next month. So thank you very much. We had a lot of thanks and fascinating presentation in the chat window.